On this episode of Cigars and Sea Story, Bennett and Mike are sitting down to talk foreign weapons. Foreign weapons. And, I mean, Cigars and Sea Stories was centered on, you know, smoking and joking and all of these other different things. Uh, the reason why I originally wanted to talk about foreign weapons as a topic is because we found a lot in my first couple of tours, and... I had no idea. Like, I, I I mean, I understood how to work in AK-47. My father had that same platform when I was growing up, so I knew that. But they're medium machine guns. They're, anytime we found a mortar tube, if we found, like, dish guns. And a lot of the Iraqi police were rolling around with all sorts of shit. Like, IPs had an MG-42 mounted in the back of their Toyota pickup truck. Like, where the fuck did you get that? And it was badass, man. I don't know if you've ever seen an MG42 in action, but that thing is badass. And it's still, uh, I hope I don't slaughter this. The MG42 is the fastest firing uh, man-made, like, air-cooled, shoulder-operated machine gun. And, of course, the, you know, the minigun is faster. and all. Oh, single barrel. That was the other thing. Single barrel machine gun. So it's still the fastest single barrel, highest rate of fire. And I mean, it's crazy and accurate unless you know what you're doing, but such a badass gun. So So. like I never did like, I know the Marine Corps got the weapons instructor, like the foreign weapons instructor course. They also have a, so I guess in theory I did take a, not, not an instructor's course, but I did, we did do a foreign weapons course because we just went out and shot the shit out of a bunch of foreign weapons. Yeah. Like AKs um, I think that, and Galil. I think that definitely became, yeah, it definitely became more um, uh, prevalent as we were in active conflict, you know, from 2001 on. Um, but, you know, like we went out, I shot like, you know, I mean, give me a break, like AKs, you know, and, and other variants, Chinese, Romanian, you know, all the different variants yeah. of the ak the fnfal the yep. uh what else j the g3 g36 um, uh the uh, uh what the hell is it it's a light machine gun rpk mp5 uh, um mp5s the drag knobs the drag knob sniper rifle got to shoot yep. that and the true boot yeah um the pkm uh machine gun yeah which has yeah. multiple variants. And then they also, uh, we didn't really get to shoot it, but some of the guys, they they brought, they had some mortarmen there that were, that showed us the, like, uh, a couple different Chinese mortar systems. Yeah. They, and then a Chinese uh, heavy machine gun, and I don't remember the. It was the Dishka. Yeah, the Dishka. Yeah. Yep. That's it. See, yeah, it's man. funny because those are all. So those are the most common enemy threat weapons that you find on the battlefield. So a foreign weapons instructor would choose that set. I mean, the, we shot majority of the same stuff when I was going through the instructor course. Right. Well, um, it's because they're still the... And isn't that crazy? Even 20... Well, not 20. So let's say 15 years later, that's still the one... that That's what the the enemy's arsenal is. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the, same, AK, the same weapons. The AK-47 is not going to go away for a No, while. ever. Pretty much ever. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's... There's 30 million of them in circulation. Plus. Right. You know, there's there's no way to get an accurate count of that because so many other threat countries produce their own version of it. There are multiple mainstay manufacturers. China, Russia, Korea um, being the predominant ones. Of course, you get... AK-47 center manufactured throughout Europe, throughout the Middle East, a variety of different places. But those are the mainstay manufacturers that have some sort of stamp on them. And primarily, that's what you're going to find on enemy combatants. You know, and 
it was funny because you brought up the PKM. There are so many different variants of the PKM. It's insane. Yeah, tons. And they load, you know, they load backwards. They're non-disintegrating link. They have multiple different types of link. They have cloth belt, and then they have the, uh, I call it like mail, like chain mail link, but it's, it's non-disintegrating link. So you take a cartridge, which a PKM medium machine gun shoots 762 by 54 rimmed, the same round that a Mosin Gaunt shoots, uh-huh. which is just a devastating round. It is. And uh, I have a shit ton of it. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Saying. And uh, what you do, so there's two different ways that you can load a non disintegrating belt. You can shove the round, so you push it up through to the bottleneck, and then you shove it in there, and you get it. As tight as tight can be and press all of the rounds down, it's time consuming. Or they invented this crank machine. There's also automated machines that do it, don't get me wrong, in big factories. But mm-hmm. if you're doing it on the battlefield, like in a fighting position, they have a crank machine where you take all of the ammunition. And it doesn't matter whether the tips are forward, backward, whatever, um, supposedly. Uh, but you put them all in there. So you know how it is. 7.62 by 5.4 rim comes in that like butcher paper it's not really wax paper yep it's like a butcher yeah and and you tear that all apart and all of the rounds are independent and you drop them into the top of this feed funnel and crank the thing around and these little mechanical arms underneath take the cartridge spin it the correct way if need be and then shove it into the non-disintegrating link and out you know in goes an empty belt out comes a fully loaded belt and then each one of those belts are ran up to the front line or what have you. And so you've uh-huh. got to learn those different ways. They also, the charging handles are different. There is a variant of the PKM where the charging handle is actually the pistol grip. Yeah, it's, um, oh, shit. I can't remember yeah, the nomenclature. I can't remember, I can't remember it either, but I know what you're talking about. It is... It's really cool. And when you see it, you're, you know, because the lack of a charging handle, it, it, it's pretty obvious. You're just like, oh, shit, you know, what the hell is going on with this thing? I don't see the operating rod. There's, you know, everything else that you would normally see on the exterior of a machine gun is not there. Uh-huh. And uh, you, you, you know, of course, keep your finger straight off the trigger. You've got the thing on uh, or off safe. So the safety is flipped forward. If you've ever operated a PKM on the left side of the, the pistol grip, there's a forward latch that basically rotates 180 degrees forward. And you flip that forward. You're supposed to use your non-dominant hand. You flip it forward and then reach up underneath, grab where you normally do, cheese stock weld, and then pull the trigger and hold it, right? Die, motherfucker, die. Die, motherfucker, die. But anyway, on those variants, it's... It makes sense because it removes one of those steps. You get in into a good, solid, stable position, forward, backward, press that trigger. So, or excuse me, yeah, forward, backward, press that trigger because the safety's off. Yeah. So, I mean, it's gangster fast. But inside of there, the operating components, well, you've got two bolts, essentially, that are working against one another, and they're riding across the top of one another. And the feed pause, see, I'm a nerd for gun. So, (laughs) So the feed pause inside of, all of those variants are different than our feed pause because you could fire, you could, you could probably put a PKM medium machine gun in a swamp, get right tightened down on the thing, good stock weld, and only the muzzle is outside of that swamp. You and everything else are submerged, chamber around, and you would probably be able to fire that open bolt weapon system underwater. Right. It's, yeah. You know, and the same thing, like, the AK-47, it was purposely built with gap space so that it could do things like that. Mm-hmm. So, well, and anything that Kalishnikov, there's a conspiracy theory that Kalishnikov did not create all of the Kalishnikov variants that we know and love. Right. But if you... Did well, you I mean, ever, technically, like, the Israelis have a variant, you know what I mean? So... Well, they do. If I, right. Yeah, but, okay... I, all right, I got to get a little nerd on this. So yeah, here we go. Get nerd. <laughs> right. So Mikhail Kalish- on us real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so so Mikhail Kalishnikov was a tank commander on 
the Eastern Front and got wounded while he was uh, fighting the Germans. He saw that they were using what would become modern assault rifles, and that was the Sturmgewehr 44, which I can't remember what it was chambered in. It was like seven. 7.38 by 5.2 or something weird like that, right? But it was it was an abstract round. So the Sturmgewehr 44, if you ever look this thing up, looks like an AK-47. He stole the idea from the Sturmgewehr. But the other thing that the Germans did, which was brilliant, is that round, the cartridge itself is not naped. It's not... Um, it doesn't have a point to it. It is... Uh, it's more like a ball. Because they modeled it after um, a lot of their uh, machine pistols and stuff like that. So think of like a bigger caliber uh, pistol round is what it looked like. And the reason why they did that is because they created bent barrels. And you can actually right. shoot around corners with Sturmgewehr 44s. So they created attachments as well as grenade attachments and everything else for these things, which is fucking nuts. You know, I have an assault rifle with a grenade attachment. Well, make sure that fucker's not on fully auto before you decide to press the thing off. There's a reason why we put it on grands. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, and so, anyhow, Mikhail Kalashnikov saw the Sturmgewehr, saw, saw what it could do. As the story goes, when he was in hospital, in the field hospital, he kind of came up with his design. And originally, it was a milled receiver, which you can... If you know anything about AKs, you can tell them apart because just above the magazine, well, there is a little dimple or a big ass, like dimple, so to speak, a big impression. The little dimple, you have a milled receiver. The big impression, that is a stamped receiver. So uh, he created this. Uh, it was um, late 40s that they started field testing everything. They created the Abstraz round, which came out of that as well, uh, but eventually fielded um, the AK-47 in 1952, I believe, is the actual date. So the original design being 47 was a milled receiver. It became a stamped receiver when it was issued to everybody. But the brilliant thing that he did was put the cleaning kit inside of the, uh, the uh, stock, which is what Eugene Stoner stole the idea from in order to put the cleaning kit in the M16. But our cleaning rods and everything in our M16 cleaning kit is all together in one kit put into the butt stock, right? For those of us who shot an A2, right? Or, or you know, yeah, yep. For instance, you had car 15s, right? Those didn't have class. Oh, stocks, no, so no, they... we had we had A2s as well. So, I, there you go. No, it, but the cars went, we didn't carry, I mean, we would on certain, certain things, yeah. Um, and then obviously when I went into the army, we had M4s and you ain't putting it in a bus stock of an M4, you know? So. Yeah. Well, in the AK-47, yeah. just under underneath of the muzzle, you had the cleaning rod, which the whole, you know how you've got a patch eyelet that you put through and stuff like that, that holes in there. Basically you can put like a, the other handle through that hole and spin it around on the inside. So anyway, the whole cleaning compartment which looks like a little test tube is in the butt stock of the AK-47 the cleaning rod is underneath of the barrel you can pull it out use the the cleaning device which malt which is also a scraper tool so if you ever pull it out you've got your eyelid in there a j-hook you have the ability to put your tool case on the end of the cleaning rod and spin your chamber brush around inside of there the PKM all of the cleaning rods are inside of the uh the bipods same thing with, like, RPDs. RPDs are, in comparison to all of the other firearms that Kalashnikov came up with, the RPD, or the Russians came up with, the RPD has the least tolerance. I'll put it to you that way. It goes down the quickest if you were to shoot it on cyclic or something like that. And the other right. thing, too, there's two things. One is, if you ever have an RPD in combat, you need to wear either an asbestos mitten or you've got to wrap something like I've seen guys wrap blouses and all sorts of shit yeah. around the barrel and the buffer tube because that bone on the front, it can get so hot. That hand guard on the front can get so hot that the lacquer inside of it will become 
like tacky, like moist. It will heat up. And when you go to grab a hold of that motherfucker, you ain't going to be able to let go. Your hand will be melted to the thing, even though you think that you just grabbed, you know, a wood handguard and you're supposed right. to be fine. So, and the other thing um, on the inside, it melts in there. So right. you can't change the barrel. That's one That's of the fun. reasons why they did away with it. Oh, God, I love guns. So, so I gotta, I gotta <laughs> re- rain in the geek on you. The Geardo fucking reins just got pulled. All right, I'm, I'm back. pulling you back in. I'm back. So, your favorite rifle to shoot? Foreign? That yeah, of of any of them? Oh no, you didn't. Ugh. Just That's like give choosing it, give your it a favorite quick. kid. What was your favorite yeah. lay? What are you talking about? Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. What? There's got to be a favorite. My favorite. You've got to have a favorite. My favorite foreign weapon to shoot is probably a fin fowl. Fin fowl. Well, those because they, they are pretty awesome. They're awesome, and they're the simplest rifle in the world. Plus, their nickname is badass. The right arm of the free world. Right. Yes. Seven six two by five one. NATO. Yep. So it shoots our three oh eight round. Tears legs off. Oh, it's a great gun. Yep. Well, and if you've ever taken one apart, it's a hinge pin, a dust cover, and then you grab a hold of the op rod. Like I I take the dust the dust cover off first. Some people don't. If you're just field stripping it, you break down the butt stock and then you can just pull the operating rod. And it's called we called it like a mouse bolt. But the you have a bolt and then just the tail of an operating rod that's hanging out. That's the internal components. The safety is just like a G3. I mean, for the yep. most part, you know, it's a flip no, forward. Sorry. It's two hey, man, different types those, of magazine those, releases. Those, those Flemish fuckers make some good weapons. <laughs> well, that was, you know, who originally designed all of that was, um, well, no. It might, it might not have been. I know, okay, so the original G3, right? All of the MP5s, the G3, all of the... Yeah, that's, that's all German. That's all Austrian. H&K. Right. That's all H&K. Those designs were bought by a Spanish company called SetMe. Yep. SetMe did all of that Yeah. Um, because the German army weren't allowed... Well, the Germans weren't allowed to have an army, essentially, right. during the Cold War, right? And so... When they went back into arms manufacturing, they basically just bought up all of the different known plans that were out there, which is, you know, brilliant. How about you? What's your favorite gun? Oh, dude, I don't know. I, uh, I, I one of the coolest guns I ever fucking, I, I like the FNFAL. Um, the, um, Scar. Yeah. Uh, was pretty cool. But the Tavor, the Israeli Tavor. Did you ever get the file that fire that? No, I don't think so. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, it's kind of like a little bullpup weapon. It's uh, it's got um, oh it's yeah, basically it's basically like a collapsed down M4 almost. Yeah, that but the and the the magazine feeds from right in front of your shoulder. Yeah, you got to go um, to the armpit. Ta- yeah, it, ta- it, it but it um. It actually uh, takes the same mags, yeah. As a as you know the American mags, yeah. Um, but it's the... really short. But it still shoots, you know, five hundred fifty meters or so. Um, it's still it's basically just a different type of version. It's compact. It's really good for special ops got forces and stuff. There's actually a bunch of police departments in the U.S. that are starting to buy them. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, that's yeah, if you like... look it up, it's pretty cool. But it's really smooth, really easy to take down. It's basically like you took an M4, pushed everything back. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then and then put a, a grip in front of the magazine well instead. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty cool. Well, it's like but the... then mm-hmm. what's it? that? And then I got to um uh yeah, the Colombians use them too which I saw that in Egypt. So that was kind of cool. But um yeah man, that was that was a fun weapon to shoot. Um and then the FN Did you ever shoot an SA80 or an L85? Yeah. That's similar no, to what you're talking so. about. I they think so. That's what the Brits carry. But our magazines right. fit I mean it's 556. Five, 
yeah, it's all five five six. So it's just kind of cool that you know you could be on the battlefield and grab their freaking shit and use it on your stuff. Right. It's well, I mean, cool. that's the point. And it's kind of right? the whole point with NATO, right? So. So yeah. So that that was cool. I gotta, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna look up the Sturmgewehr. I I have to. It's the STG TAC four four. If you guys are following along at home. But I I've never been a you know I mean I like to shoot weapons and stuff i just never got into the small arms as much i was just never really a uh yeah small arms geek i guess you could say oh i now i did all i I did a lot of my research on you know planes and boats and that type of stuff so did you ever this this is a poll so um did you ever shoot a thompson Oh, I, uh, the Thompson machine gun, like a World War II? Yeah. No, I've never gotten to fire one. I've always wanted to. So a lot of people don't know that there are multiple variants of a Thompson, which blows me away that you don't realize. Anyway, so Google that shit. But you've got box style magazines. They call them stick mags at the time, I believe. At least Marines were that. And then you had your drum. That's what all the gangsters carried around. Drum full of ammunition. Hey, why didn't you guys carry that into World War II? I'm going to tell you why. Because that's a lot of fucking metal to carry around. Just a quick side note. Um, but the stick magazines, of course, and that being a like a full, blow, full bore machine pistol round. Mm-hmm. And the entire operating mechanism was all in the body of the firearm. Right? So... Uh, same thing. If you have like an MP5 or something like that, it works on a gas blowback system. You can always tell that an MP5 was shot in the vicinity because when you look at the side of a nine mil casing, it'll have vertical carbon lines, stripes on it because it was fire gas blowback. Mm-hmm. Any round, any brass that you find those vertical lines on, it was a gas blowback round. So anyway, that's a little bit more nerd talk. But on some of the variants that Thompson's made that Thompson made the charging handle is on the top and they're all open bolt I believe um but you have a side charging handle variant which was an in-service variant and then you had a top charging handle variant which doubled as your rear side aperture so you would basically like knife hand across the top lock the bolt to the rear look through the charging handle, which is the rear horns, you know what I mean? The the snowman or the castle or whatever traditional pistol sight you want to call right. it. And then you had the Thompson, which had a fixed uh, rear sight aperture with an elongated sight plane. So the Thompson's sight plane for the forty five caliber round that it was shooting was technically too long given the accuracy of that round over a given yardage. Because, I mean, you know, I'm sure that Thompson's were fantastic on Iwo Jima, but I mean, like, I'm the guy who would carry a 30. I'm that dude. I'm carrying a 30 all day, you know? The 30 Uh carbine, what we were shooting, which not the 30 ST, which was the, I think it was the 30 ST, the 30 caliber with the box ammunition and whole nine, Marines were issued the 30 carbine as a standard issue rifle, as well as the M M1 Garand and so on and so forth for the Pacific theater. But it did not have the collapsible wireframe stock that, you know, like para Rangers or whatever the um, pathfinders would carry and stuff like that. It was different. I'm just such a nerd for guns. I actually have, I was over at Thomas Brennan's house and he's got a 30 cal and I saw the magazine sitting on his kitchen table and was like, is that a 30 caliber carbine magazine? And he's just, (laughs) he's like, dude, there's, you know, there are some people who would know that. And there's just some people who don't. And I I would know that. And I'm like, do you have the gun that goes with it? He's like, it's in the shop right now, but (laughs) (laughs) that's really funny. Dude, did anyone else carry flamethrowers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Same Army like World War II. Time. The Army invading forces on uh, Normandy, allied forces carried flamethrowers. Well, I know that. I'm saying anyone else besides the U.S. 
Did like the did like the Third yeah. Reich have fucking flamethrowers? Yes, they did. And never they really had see, flame, I never really see that. So they that's had what I'm flamethrower tanks. Oh, I guess they did. Flame Flamen Werfer yeah. 35. That's the nomenclature of the flamethrower. I'm pretty sure the Holy Japanese hell. had oh. some too. What a fucking sick ass weapon. But but yet a death trap for the freaking oh, operator. <laughs> Dude, you hold that trigger down too long. That's when you've got to have that die motherfucker die discipline. Yeah, it's this the trench, you know. Holy shit, bro. Could you imagine though? I mean, <sighs> you always see it on like the movies where they'll, you know, come through and then the next thing you know, they stick the barrel of one of those into a fucking fighting hole, you know, into yeah. like a pillbox and just oh bro, devastating. Yeah. Let's but if see. you get shot with one on, you're fucked. Oh yeah. Well, I, it depends. Yeah, no, no, yeah, exactly. But it, you can be fucked. If you get hit with a tracer round, you're going to be real fucked. I mean, if you... Oh, dude. Yeah, man. Because you got to remember, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, dude, that's some Hollywood bullshit, blah, blah, blah. I'm here to tell you right now, if you shoot 240 link with 240 tracer link, yeah. you will you will blow up a fucking camp a propane tank i know that oh, for God, a yeah. fact yeah, yeah yeah i know that too and if you um, ever want or, or you could just strap a uh i'm not saying i've actually done this but it does make fun booming stuff happen uh maybe um allegedly uh strapping a road flare to a propane tank <laughs> lighting the road flare running away and then shooting it makes a big boom too. No tracer needed. Yes. Uh, yes. That shit is crazy. Just saying. Well, right. And the other allegedly. thing, allegedly the other thing, and I highly condone and I hope that you try this out, uh, put a propane tank in front of a steel plate mm. and light that fucker up and mm. you'll get enough splash and spark coming off of it to where you'll ignite it. We did that with the little green propane tanks, the little camp yeah, yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah, the little camp ones. I mean, I've blown up. I've put I mean, like I three... did a twenty pound, a twenty pound propane tank. Yeah, fucking blows up, bro. Oh yes, it does. Like people don't, people don't get it. Like that shit. Yeah. Right. Wow. Damn. Right. Well, then that is the well. That's what they're using in the movies when you get the Hollywood explosion. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Because that's the mm. other side of side. It's just what a what a horrible IED. Yeah. Oh, right. We it's I've done, been hit. I've been hit by a fuel saying, enhanced I, IED know. before. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh dude, I have definitely been hit by a fuel enhanced IED, and I've definitely seen multiple fuel enhanced IEDs go off. And you're absolutely right. There. The the thing that a lot of folks don't understand is that the fire, yeah, is devastating and can fuck your day up but also that's not nearly as devastating as putting in multiple rounds of ammunition you know what i mean that's the you know it's really impressive yeah, and yeah, leaves yeah, a big yeah, black right? cloud but unless you added you know a lot of shrapnel to it it's not going to do anything you can just wrap it with like nails and right well that's what those fuckers turn it do. into a giant claymore basically that's you know, what they that's, do i'm telling you right now i've seen horrible. it before what they do is they take all of their shrapnel and they throw it in a cesspool. They rub it around in feces and shit and urine yeah. and all sorts of right. stuff. And and then what they do is they put it on. Uh, they'll they'll put it on blankets. They'll put it on whatever. It doesn't matter. And then they take the the propane tank or whatever and they wrap it and tie it around the propane tank so that as that fucker blows big, it's spraying you know, septic laden shrapnel through the air. I mean, yep. you want to talk about ruining your fucking day. So there were guys, there were guys who lost a foot. And by the time they got home, it was amputated all the way up to the hip. Cause, it's horrible. Cause it was just, you know, that's how the enemy rolls. Cocksuckers. Yep. Motherfucking biological yeah. warfare. Well, and it's like, you know, you mentioned flamethrowers. One of the biggest tossing, things. Tossing cows over the fucking parapets. Right. <laughs> That's saying. what it reminded me of. Yes. Right. Well, and they would put explosives in dead dogs. Yeah, but it's fucking effective. That's yeah. the thing. And it's like, you know, you use those kind of tactics. And uh, yeah, man. Yeah. And people just don't. Yeah. You don't think about this. If it's all, oh, we're, we're beyond that. Right. No. no. 
No, no we're not. Well, no, it's like um, another guy found a uh, another unit found a leg, a severed leg. And I'm pretty sure I shared this before, but the clever fuckers took this guy's pant off. I mean, you could tell that it was premeditated. They like ripped the dude's pant leg off, chopped his leg off below the knee, put a one five five round in where yeah, the quadriceps would that. be, and then tied the top of the pant leg, which was the dead giveaway. So you have. Yeah, I mean, that was so fucked up, it was insane. You have a pant leg with a foot, and and what's the first thing that you ask yourself? Is mm. there a shoe on it? Yeah. I right. mean, literally, they were like, hey, we found a leg with a 155 shell in it, like an amputated leg with a 155 shell in it, you know, in the middle of Central or whatever. And literally, the very first thing that we heard come across the net was is there a boot on it is there shoes there's something yeah do they have a fucking sandal or whatever it it was hilarious like everybody in the truck was laughing as the guy sent the communication back like yes it does have one of those haji sandal things on there well what what, (laughs) for nothing else here's here's what's kind of a a side effect of these the conflicts that we've been in since oh one right yeah is everyone it gave us back the thinking of asymmetric warfare where um whereas in army and we had lost it frankly after vietnam uh because we had been away from it for so long it was you know oh we're gonna have the big tank battle uh you know like the first gulf war and that kind of like gave a bunch of people um you know the ability oh yeah it's, we're gonna have this you know we need tanks we need big fat fucking tanks and and <laughs> other things yeah and and bradley's and everything else to get guys you know what i mean mm-hmm. and 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 that's part of the reason that frankly george bush didn't want to do what happened is because they knew what would happen um getting marred into freaking you know street battles yeah uh, where your tanks uh, can be effective but yet they're not <laughs> um so it, it it's given us back that whole idea that you have to have such a diverse force um with light and heavy that you can just go in there and kick ass and take names versus um yeah. being a one-trick pony and I don't understand. I never, you know, which, you know what, that all comes down to money. Um, it comes down to who, who wants the money and are they going to push? Well, this is what the new next war is going to be like, you know, oh, it's going to be an air war or it's going to be a tank battle or it's going to be whatever. But too often we fall into that trap or politicians do. Yeah. And the, so we, we train for one way. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I was in the Marines, our our enemy was the Spetsnaz. That's mm-hmm. who we fought. That's who we've trained to fight against. Right. Right? Right. You know what I mean? This fucking Spetsnaz. Right. Really? No, I get Lo it. Lo and behold, it wasn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just but saying. you knew all the... Well, and that's the difference, too, is... I'm going to tell you right now. Policy can be policy. The United States Marine Corps and all of the other branches don't give a fuck what your foreign policy is. No, what we do... So if we have NATO, if we have NATO allied nations, we work with them. We learn their weapons. We learn their tactics. They learn our weapons. They learn our tactics. We share all allied, you know, knowledge back and forth in order to potentially create a phalanx on the battlefield. And oh, by the way, know how to use your shit. My shit ever goes down in the middle of a firefight. Correct. But then we go one step further, and we train our individual fighting forces on foreign weapons, like. I, I, I got to I got to share this little C story because it the guy is a good enough human being. Yeah, whatever. But my my leadership on the last go around as a as an advisor, my platoon commander was off his fucking rocker thinking that we were never going to employ foreign weapon systems. Yeah, he doesn't flat, make any sense. He took foreign weapons knowledge off of our training schedule mm. and flat out said, if you do this, I'm going to hammer your ass to the wall. So I went behind his back like any good sergeant would, went to my 
uh, training cadre at Special Operations Training Group and said, here is my certification. I literally went to my, uh, to my, what's the, Reen online, printed off my fucking certifications and said, I am a foreign weapons instructor trainer, as well as I am a formal school instructor. So if you don't want to take responsibility for this, that's fantastic. But I need those weapons to train my guys. And after lights out, I got everybody out of the rack, out across the way to the classroom, and then went over there and trained the guys after hours on foreign weapons. Thank God I did. You know, and it wasn't it wasn't me. It wasn't like, hey, this is it. I will take ultimate responsibility for being the guy who went behind the back. But what I mean is everybody else wanted that knowledge. All of my fellow instructors were on board with this. We trained together in order to learn this. And if we got caught, Sergeant Penny was going to take the heat kind of a thing. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Right. But then when we got overseas, thank God we did that. Because the very first thing that they said they wanted, you know, you do, you do your counterpart interaction with one another and you're asking them through an interpreter, what can we do for you? And we're working with one another and they wanted weapons handling. Well, these fuckers are walking around, hanging on to an AK by the magazine, you know, walking around condition one, flagging everybody behind them, finger on the trigger all the time, all of these other different things. And of course, we wound up kicking a weapons handling package like train them on their own pistols trained them on their own rifles the whole nine yards at first they didn't give a fuck they were like who cares who cares that you went to school for this but then i told them that my grandfather taught my father who taught me and that's how marines learn weapons and they fucking they they were locked on at that point because it matters that it's handed down knowledge from generation to generation. The fact that you went to school, they don't even know what that is. They don't give a shit that you went to school. But the fact that your grandfather taught his father or, or, or taught your father, so on and so forth, all the way down the line, that matters. Yeah. So we did a 25-yard um, uh, BZO to make sure that all of their weapons were up. We used the Kalashnikov site adjustment tool, um, which operates backwards from an M16 site plane. So... Just think of that whenever you try to sight in your AK. Got them entirely locked on at 25 yards. They qualified at 25, 50, 75, 100. And those who could basically shoot it, we would let go back to 150. And we also zeroed our sasser out there on that range. Um, but we, it was fantastic. When we were in country, we took the landing zone, took pallets. And I, I'll, we should do another episode on how to build a box range. But we... We took everything that was needed from the resources that were around us, and we created a box range with, I want to say we had 20. It might have been 10. I think it was 10. But correct size and dimensions, correct BZO targets. Uh, we had the correct tools, and we did all of this on a landing zone out in Kajaki up near the dam. You know, uh -huh. you've got to drive across the dam to get to the LZ kind of thing. And... uh it was fucking cool, man. It was just cool in general, having that amount of responsibility, discipline, so on and so forth. And of course, meanwhile, leadership is going, you know, when you get killed, you're the one responsible and all of this other shit. And I'm like, dude, if, and this is, this is verbatim what I told my platoon commander. I said, if I can do this with a bunch of stupid fucking lieutenants, 300 of you morons, I guarantee I can do it with these Afghans and not a single person got hurt. There was not a single negligent discharge. There was nothing that went bad. And a matter of fact, shortly thereafter, they went over the mountain and wound up killing a bunch of the henchmen for this IED guy. And he wound up getting captured in Kandahar and they all came back. You know, it's like eight guys on a fucking moped come riding back, hooting and hollering, celebratory fire, all this other shit. And that's how I earned the nickname Topak Malem, the Rifle Wise Man, which is awesome. Okay, you know. Way better than White Devil. You don't want to get yeah. called White Devil. Don't be that right. guy. But yeah. And it was, dude, it was the reason why that happened is because the Marines and Sailors together as a team were like, this needs to fucking happen. And even though. They probably hated me for it as far as the instructor roundtable was concerned. I 
love and I'm so proud of the guys who went through the instructor training to learn how to do all of these things and implemented it. And they were the ones doing it. I was the, like when we did the range, I, I was the chief range safety officer for the range. I couldn't even conduct training when you're, you know, when you're CSO, that's it. You know, so it's just, I couldn't, I couldn't touch a gun. I couldn't conduct any training outside of the initial range brief or any safety actions. I could in between courses of fire, but they had their own coaches at each one of their points. And then they acted as the um, position safety officer, the PSO. So it was one of those, I was just insanely proud of fellow Marines and sailors and what have you who are up there hooking and jabbing and learning another country's weapon system, training them through their language using interpreters. And then here you go. The battle space is yours, which all the while you are very cognizant that you might be training the future enemy. Yeah, for sure. Which is something else that we've talked about before on the show. I mean, it's yep. something that I wrestled with prior to going overseas and that's, mm. you know, none of our guys were ever shot in the back, at least not us who we were operating yeah, with all right. of these different folks. And that's a story for another time, but the foreign weapons knowledge is going to get there. Whether yeah. whether LT says you can do that or not, go do yep. it. Do yes. it. It's better right. to ask for forgiveness than beg for permission. Fuck that. Go do it. It's going to benefit your guys. Train harder. It's that simple. Yeah. You know? Hey, we're going to Afghanistan. Great. We're all going to learn Spanish. That's fucking stupid. Good initiative. Bad judgment. That's... Mm -mm. Hey, we're going to Afghanistan. Everybody should know how to use an AK-47. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good yeah, idea. Exactly. You should it's, know it's how it's booby trapped. Weapon, right? Exactly. Well, then how did they booby trap it? Right. What What are you gonna do? Are you gonna Are you gonna happen upon an AK forty seven out on the battlefield? And then what? You're gonna take it down to condition four? Come on! Don't be that guy. Don't be the guy who picks up an enemy threat weapon when you when you might not know whether or not there's a grenade underneath. Don't be that guy. Yeah. You know, and then. All right, situation dictates. Are you going to downgrade it all the way? You know, some of those fuckers, like if you downgrade a battlefield AK-47, you put the muzzle up in the air, you put the buttstock on the deck, you remove the source of ammunition, and you begin to expect, inspect all the external components to see if there's any sort of explosive or anything. Then you charge your rifle with the buttstock in the deck because those little fuckers will tear apart the insides and put like a sharpened operating rod in there and you go to charge the rifle with it in your shoulder, you know, you'll punch that thing straight into your shoulder. Right. Little operating rod will punch out the the back end. They put plastic uh. explosives in the in the hand guards. They follow the things up and do all sorts of shit. Whatever you do, don't try to shoot it. You need to have that thing entirely stripped down and you need to have an armor look at it. Not the guy like me who knows foreign weapons. Whatever you do. Which is no. You know, I know how to make that thing safe. I'm not going to tell you how to put it back into the fight. At least not right, right now. You've got an M4. Yeah, let's go. You know, and that's that's some of the other stuff. You need to learn foreign threat weapons so that you can make them safe. And then they're no longer threats. Not so that you can pick it up and use it. Dude, your M4 is going to rock the socks off of any AK variant that's out there. Even the AN-104. Even, even the AN-92 and all of these other ones that are out there. But, you know, I'm a nerd for guns. I'm a nerd for training. And if you got a badass gun, I want to train with it. I think that's the bigger thing. I want to know how it works. I want to know the components. I want to handle that thing. I want to get it going. So, but yeah, man, awesome. I should wrap it up. I'm a gun nerd. If you're a gun nerd too, leave us your comments. We would, uh, we'd love to have more gun nerds on talking about your foreign weapons experiences and all of that other stuff. Dude, we should have on instructor okay. one back. So that Ron, yeah. can, you know, well, I know I talked to him about it already. Um, cause he's got a new product coming out. So yes, he does. And it's badass. So we will, uh, get yeah. him on for that. I already talked to him about it. Hell yes. Folks. Thank you so much for listening. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're at, at Cigars and C, at Cigars and C. All of our discount codes, anywhere that you go, it's always Cigars and C, just like our Twitter and our Facebook and everything else. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, and this is for our veterans who are entrepreneurs. If you folks own a business 
you need exposure, you want to get listed, you want to grow your network, so on, veteranslist.us. Veteranslist.us. We've had Will on the show, Will Amos. He's done an episode of Scars and Seasters. Rick Yost of veteranslist.us has done an episode of Scars and Seasters. These guys are awesome, and they're working towards a better solution for veteran business owners, for certifying veterans who are out there as influencers, what have you, doing a variety of different things. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, 50% off, half off your featured membership discount code Cigars and C. Half off a featured membership, 50% off when you enter in discount code Cigars and C on veteranslist.us. You're going to want to be on there. That's where a lot of our network came from. Hell, that's where we found Spartan Media. And Spartan Media is another one of our sponsors. They did our website. And Jeremy over at Spartan Media, fellow Marine 03, who we've got to have on the show, still haven't had that happen because the guy's been busy with all of this business coming out of Veterans List. We had so, him on, we had him on uh, Change Your POV. There you go. That was good. So, so I... Take a look. The reason why these folks are our sponsors isn't necessarily because they're giving us money. It's because there are partners. There are yeah. fellow veterans who are out there kicking ass and taking names. And of course, Heroes Media Group, which is a veteran led podcasting network. And we get the PR out there with Life Lit Media. Life Lit Media runs tactical PR for veteran led companies. It is a Marine 03 who runs Life Lit Media. Eric Mitchell had him on the show multiple times. And uh, it's all about storytelling, not story yelling. So get in touch with LifeLip if you are a veteran-owned company that wants some of that PR. So if you're paying attention here real quick, Spartan Media can build a website. You can get noticed on veteranslist.us. You could get out there as a podcaster and leverage podcasting through Heroes Media Group. And the PR side is going to come out of LifeLip Media, all by listening to Cigars and Sea Stories. Yeah. It's almost oh. like it's meant to be. And you can download the five paragraph business plan, cigars and series.com forward slash five P and get that business up and rolling with all of our folks here. Isn't that great? That's what it's all about. One stop shop. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> well, it wasn't intended to be that way. It's I just, know. It's the way that it's worked out. I know. But hey, it's fantastic. Get out there and make it happen. Hell yes. Thank you, folks, for listening to another episode of Cigars and Sea Stories. Thank you so much to all of our sponsors. Subscribe, rate, review the podcast time now. And on that note, we cue the music. I will drag them for two.